Revelation 1, verse 12, and let's read down to verse 20 and pray that we were able to cover that. I don't know that we will be, but let's do it. Revelation 1, verse 12, and before we read, let me tell you that this is indeed a glorious passage. There is nothing in the Gospels like what you're going to read about Jesus Christ. You are now getting a glimpse of what Jesus is like after his resurrection from the dead. Can you believe it? God is going to tell you about what Jesus is like now. I know we often relate to him as he walked the hills of Judea and Samaria and the high steep plateaus of Galilee. We relate to him that way, but we ought to know that that is the Jesus that lived 1900 years ago. And he now has a resurrected body and he is glorified. And you're going to now read about what he looks like now. And it is awesome to say the least. I think of that song written by Jack Hayford that we've sung so many years now in our churches across America. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flows from the throne unto his own, his anthem rays. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Come glorify, magnify. Jesus who died, now glorified. King of all kings. Majesty. You, you, you just feel it as you read this passage. Revelation 1.12. Here's what it says. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were, uh, they were like fine bronze, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. Let's pray. Father, we need your divine guidance and direction, that we would be faithful to the word of God. We would not interpret it in our own mind. That, Father, we would seek that interpretation which you have authorized by the power of the Holy Spirit controlling these writers. Help us, Lord, to be dedicated to the word of God, for the entrance of thy word gives light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Father, we are in great need of understanding the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ. We are in great need of seeing him, our glorified, risen Savior. And may we respond as John with worship and adoration falling before him. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts tonight. We come to learn about Jesus. We come to learn about it. he who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's in his precious, wonderful name. Amen. There are two things in this passage. Uh, one deals with the revelation of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, verses 12 to 18. And then the last little paragraph of two verses deals with the responsibility that has been given to the Apostle John concerning this fabulous revelation. And of course, the whole book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember always that it refers to two things. One, it does refer to the event of the second coming in power and great glory at the end of the tribulation. But two, the words, a revelation of Jesus Christ, refers to an exaltation of Christ. 
You are learning about Christ as you learn in no other New Testament epistle. And none of the Old Testament as well, although it quotes, as we have mentioned before, voluminously from the Old Testament. So let's take a look at the revelation of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to see 12 characteristics about our blessed Lord. Number one is his centrality. His centrality. The Bible says that he turned to see the voice that spoke with, me, with him, and being turned, he saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst, or the middle, of the seven lampstands was one like the Son of, of Man. He is in the middle of the seven lampstands. Now, verse 20 says the lampstands are the seven churches, the centrality of Christ. So what you have, if you're picturing it or drawing on a paper, you can put Jesus Christ in the middle, and then the seven lampstands, you can form a circle around him. He's in the middle of them. Look at chapter 2, verse 1, uh, just an example of how this is used. Concerning the message to the church of Ephesus, it says, These things saith he who, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, in verse 12... And 13, he's in the middle, but in chapter 2, verse 1, he is walking among the, uh, the lampstands. His centrality does not mean passivity or being apathetic or passive to what is happening. Our Lord is continuing to walk among the churches, observing, as we shall learn in the messages to the seven churches. He knows what we are doing. He is observing all that is taking place. The centrality of our Lord Jesus. Turn to chapter 5. And look at verse 6. I would simply ask the question, is the Lord central in your thoughts and in your life? In chapter 5, verse 6, it says, I beheld and lo, in the midst, in the middle of the throne, and of the four living creatures, who are cherubim angels, and in the midst or the middle of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. We hope to show you who the 24 elders are when we come to that in chapter 4. Uh, I happen to believe it represents the church of Jesus Christ, and we will give you our reasons for that, which, of course, means that I do believe the church of Jesus Christ will be in heaven during the tribulation. But according to the Bible, the Lamb of God is in the middle of all those 24 elders who sit on 24 thrones, the centrality of Jesus Christ. He's called in Colossians 1.18, the head of the church, and may we never forget it. Just to expand that a little bit, in Matthew 18, will you turn there, please? In Matthew 18, we have instruction from our Lord Jesus Christ about how to handle the discipline of sinning brothers and sisters. Matthew chapter 18, and how the church is to do this. We pick it up at verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 15. It says, Moreover, if thy brother, Matthew 18, 15, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, so someone has actually sinned against you, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. That's what it says. If he shall hear thee, if he responds, you've gained your brother. Case closed. Verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, he remains rebellious to it. Tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a tax collector. Sorry, all you IRS agents. <laughs> but they were worse than you are, hopefully. Verse 18, <laughs> consider that divine wisdom preparing you for the tax audit that is coming your way. Verse 18, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. Now remember, this is in the context of this passage. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Well, how are you binding it? You are binding or establishing the veracity of what was said by the two or three witnesses. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth 
as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the middle, in the midst of them. Now technically he's talking about the two or three witnesses and the issue applies to church discipline. But he actually expands it from that point because in verse 19 it says, if you'll agree touching anything that they shall ask. So it's not simply uh, the confirmation and establishment of what was said verified by two or three people listening to it and whatever they bind or whatever they loose for that matter is bound or loosed in heaven but he took it a step further and say if those two or three uh, are asking God to do something and they agree on it they come together it shall be done for them by my fathers in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name there am I in the midst or in the middle of them. You see, Jesus said in John 14, 13 and 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That if you ask in my name, the Father will be glorified in the Son. The authority and character of Christ is always an issue, even in believing prayer. So the centrality of Christ in the lives of believers is what is emphasized by the picture of the risen, glorified Christ. He's in the middle of the lampstands. Chapter 2, verse 1, he walks in the middle of the lampstands. He's continuing to circulate, continuing to observe what's going on. And in chapter 5, in that great scene in heaven, he's in the middle of all that's taking place in heaven. The elders are all around him. He's in the middle of them. He's in the middle of the angels who are the worship leaders. He's in the middle of it all. Christ is the central issue of the entire Bible. And what a precious passage that is. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Uh, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I happen to believe that there are two or three believers gathered here tonight in his name. Amen? Amen. Therefore, Jesus Christ is in the midst. Now, let me explain this. If there was only one believer here, Jesus Christ is here. You've got to understand that. Christ liveth in me. But the point of two or three and him in the middle is dealing with the centrality of Christ in the lives of the believers and leads to an argument of authority and submission to that authority. We are talking about Jesus being the head and all of us submitting to him. And when two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the middle. Well, he's always present within the individual believer. But the point is that our Lord's authority is there and we need to understand that we need to honor him and submit to his authority i have tried to look at this in a practical way i'm not going to try to make it mystical in any sense it seems to me that there are two basic ways that you and i submit to the authority of jesus christ two basic ways. you could come up with some ramifications of this i suppose but here's what i have nestled it down to one you indicate your submission to him by whether or not you ever pray and talk to him about anything. Every time you get on your knees and inquire of the Lord, as King David did over and over again, every time you get on your knees and ask God to help you to understand, to help you to cope with something, to help you see his will, see his purpose, you are submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ. So we do it by prayer. And secondly, we do it by obedience to the word of God. That's how we submit to the authority of Jesus Christ in our life. Everything else is just talk. You can say, well, he's the head of our church, but it may look like some others are running it. We need to have submission to the authority of Jesus Christ. Prayer, obedience to the word, are the primary ways that is achieved. Now back, please, to Revelation chapter 1. The first characteristic of our risen Lord is his centrality. Number two, interestingly, is his humanity. His humanity. But it's not simply a statement of being human. It's a statement about God becoming man. It's a statement about the Messiah. It says, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Now the term the Son of Man, you might say in the Gospels is a favorite term of Jesus Christ. But a lot of us read it and we think only of his humanity. That is, he's somebody's boy, son of a man. Therefore, he is human. But there's more to it. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. All of you who were here last Lord's Day, you were in Daniel 7. Amen? 
and you have it now down so pat that this is, hey, no problem at all. Daniel 7, look at verse 13. The phrase, the Son of Man, is a messianic term. It's referring to the Messiah. Messiah will be a man. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, a term for the Father himself, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him, this Son of Man, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man, a messianic term, one like the Son of Man, Revelation 1, 13 says. Remember I told you to mark the word like and as. They are similes. The word like, uh, hamoion in Greek, means a likeness in external form. Remember that Jesus is more than mere man. So you have to use the word like. He is not only and merely a Son of Man. He is the Son of Man, Messiah, but he is more than man. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, please. People often ask, was Jesus a real human being? Of course. Well, did he suffer like we suffer? Yes. Was he tempted like we are? Yes, but without sin. Uh, did he get thirsty? Yeah. Did he get hungry? Yes. Uh, did he get tired? Yes. All of those things are stated uh, in the New Testament about our Lord Jesus Christ. But in Philippians, there is an analysis of the person of Christ that is absolutely remarkable by the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 2. Sometimes people will call this the kenosis of Christ, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. It's a Greek word meaning emptying. How, in fact, did God become a man? In Philippians chapter 2, uh, picking up at verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now watch it. The word form there is not the word appearance. It's the word morphe, from which we get our metamorphosis term. Morphe refers to the exact nature or substance of a matter. What you're saying is that Jesus Christ was in the exact nature and substance of God. Now it says he, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What that means is he didn't think it was a thing to be grasped or to be paraded he didn't go around saying, watch what you say to me, because after all, I'm God and can zap you on the spot. No, Jesus never talked like that or said that. He humbled himself, came into this world. He was one like the Son of Man, which causes you to remember the Messiah will become man. But it also uh, causes you to understand he's not merely man, for he is like the Son of Man. He is, in fact, God. Verse 7 says, he made himself of no reputation. Greek word kenosis. He emptied himself. Um, did he then strip himself of being God? No. Uh, you might translate he laid aside the exercise of his divine attributes. He, he still had his divinity. He still had his deity. He is still God. He never ceases to be God. But what he did when he came to this world is lay aside the exercise, the automatic, we would say, exercise of his divine attributes. Now, did he ever express them? Certainly. Remember in the garden when they arrested him? Uh, he took one look at the, that uh, uh, conglomeration of soldiers, and they all fell over backwards like dominoes. So every now and then, he showed you who he is. Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, he pulled back, as it were, the curtain of his flesh and gave Peter, James, and John uh, a glimpse into who he really is. And they, the Bible says he was transfigured. A metamorphosis took place. The true nature of Christ came out in brilliant rays of light. And they were absolutely blinded when they finally recovered and picked themselves up. The Bible says they saw no one but Jesus only. Very interesting. Peter was so excited. It's so great to be here. Uh, man, this is wonderful. Moses and Elijah showed up. Let's build a tabernacle for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. All of a sudden, a voice from heaven says, no, no, this is my beloved son. You hear him. Forget Moses and Elijah. I know they're big on the kosher list, but get rid of them. <laughs> They're not worthy to be mentioned in the same breath with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen? That's what it's all about. 
I'll keep reading verse 7. He emptied himself or laid aside the exercise of his divine attributes or emptied himself. He did it willingly and took upon him the form of a servant. Now, is the word form here an external appearance only, not the reality? And the answer is no. This is the beautiful thing about the nature of God. Did you know that God in his exact nature, substance, and being, again, it's the word morphe, is a servant? Wow. Wow. God wants us all to be servants. And isn't it fascinating to know that our Lord Jesus Christ, in his true nature as God, is a servant. He doesn't become one. He is one. He came to minister to serve, not to be ministered unto, and to give his life a ransom for many. May God make us all like our Savior. Now it says he was found in fashion as a man. Now here's a word for external appearance. And remember, in Revelation, it says one like the Son of Man. The external appearance, it's man. It's a real man. But his true nature is God. It is God in human flesh. Uh, the Bible says the word became flesh, not was flesh. He was spirit. God is spirit. He became flesh, a change of condition. When he was born as a baby in Bethlehem, he existed before that. The Son of God is eternal, but he became a baby in Bethlehem. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, says John in John 1.14. Here, he's found in fashion. It's our idea of schizophrenic. A double personality, a schizo, two type people. The point is, there's an external appearance, but there's more underneath. There's something else. He was God. Was he man? Yes. But being found in fashion or appearance as a man, it says he humbled himself. Nobody humbled him. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of, not the cross, there's no definite article in the Greek, just a cross. Don't glory in the cross. Glory in the Christ of the cross. And the next words are absolutely fascinating to me. It says, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Wherefore, on the basis of what he did, humbled himself and went to, to, to the cross to die for us. Wherefore, on that basis, God exalted him. And in the Greek, there is a play on the words. The word exalted means to be lifted up. In John 3, 14, John said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. There's a play on the words. The moment at which God was really exalting him is the moment that he is dying on the cross. He was lifted up on a cross, and God takes that and says, Wherefore, God has highly lifted him up. If you want to see the exaltation of Christ, see the Savior dying on the cross for your sins and for mine. God, the infinite God who flung the worlds into existence and made you and me, God humbled himself, became flesh, and dwelt among us. And this wonderful, wonderful Savior of ours God has now highly lifted up and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Man, that is unbelievable. It's just incredible to me to understand. You say, would you really understand God becoming flesh? No, I don't at all. You say, well, I thought you just went through it. I did. <laughs> Do you understand it? No, I don't. Let me try to illustrate the complexity of this matter. You know, it's one thing to try to say it to an audience. It's another thing to really understand it. Because we're entering into ground that I sometimes think is the holy of holies. I take the facts of the Bible to be absolutely true whether I can reconcile them or not. He is God Almighty in human flesh. Now, how he who fills the universe with his presence could localize himself in a physical corporeal substance is beyond me. No wonder the Bible calls it the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. How can any of us understand that he who fills the universe, for you can't ever run away from his presence, could somehow localize himself in a physical body and then say about that body, in that body dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Colossians 2.9. It's incredible. But let me give you an illustration to show you the complexity of this. Suppose there were a group of ants 
crawling on this pulpit. Up. Well, there, by golly, look at <laughs> No, but anyway, suppose there were some ants. <laughs> Maintenance, don't worry, I haven't found one, it's all right. But suppose there were, and suppose that I, as a man, say, say to the, this situation, I, I want to communicate with those ants. Now, I could um, pound the pulpit and say, listen up, guys. No response. Could put a giant sign, you know, drop things from the air. Please, please, hire a marketing agency, anything to communicate. Put up a satellite television, anything. I'm not doing a job. What do I have to do to communicate with those ants, anybody? You become one. Now, it's incredible for me to even fathom how I would somehow be able to put myself into the little ant and start communicating. Hey, ants, all right. <laughs> You'll never believe what I was before I got here. Yeah. Okay. It may be crude, but I think it's a small step to illustrate the enormity of what we're talking about, which I, I wonder sometimes if we as believers really understand. It must seem very strange to those without Christian consensus who come from other religions of the world into our country and to hear us talk about God becoming a man. What an incredible concept. And that is the gospel. Go back to Revelation again. It was like the Son of Man. Oh, a messianic term, all right. But the whole story of the Messiah... Uh, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be on, on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. And get this one, the Everlasting Father, or the Father of the Ages, the Prince of Peace. We're talking the Messiah. And what does it say? Unto us a child is born. How could the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, become a little child? The mystery of the whole gospel. No wonder people struggle with it. We call it the incarnation, meaning God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so there is so much here in verse 13. When you read, one like the Son of Man, it's a reminder of his humanity, reminder that he came to die on a cross. Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. If you ask me, why did Jesus come? Why did the eternal Son of the living God become a man? I could answer, uh, well, to show us what we ought to be like. That certainly is, is told to us many times in the Bible, to walk as he walked. I could say to you, to show us what God is like. And that's true also. But we know the fundamental issue of the gospel is he came to die on a cross for our sins. To take care of the problem that exists between us and God for our sins have separated between us and God so that he will not hear. One like the Son of Man is packed with phenomenal meaning. He is human, yes, but that is not all he is. And the next words uh, as we go down through the description will show us that fact. His humanity. By the way, the term Son of Man is used 84 times in the Gospels alone. 84 times, and I love this, 21 of them refer to the second coming. Isn't it great that God wants all of us to know that after his resurrection, he's still a man? When you get to heaven, you're going to immediately be able to relate to Jesus Christ without any trouble whatsoever. He will not be smoke filtering out through the corridors of heaven. Uh, God is spirit, and he dwells everywhere. But isn't it gracious of our Lord to give us an everlasting revelation of himself in human form? Think of it. The incredible love of God, the incredible condensation, condescension of the loving God that we serve. He is going to be a man so that we can relate to him forever. We're going to see Jesus in his glorified, resurrected body. And some cults say, well, it's not a real body. But after his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, Luke 24, and he said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. He invited men to touch him. He said to Thomas, you don't believe? Touch me and see. A lot of people say, well, they, they never actually touched him. It's just meant for our encouragement. Oh, yes, they touched him. 1 John 1, 1, that which we have seen, that which we've heard, that which our hands have handled. 1 John 1, 1, yes, they touched him. Wouldn't you? 
If he died on the cross and you heard he rose from the dead and all of a sudden you saw him in the room and he didn't come through the door, wouldn't you have wanted to figure out what, hey, are we dreaming or what? Is he real? I don't know, John, grab him. <laughs> you don't think the disciples did that? Why, the first person he appeared to is Mary Magdalene and Jesus had to say to her, stop clinging to me. She wasn't going to let go. I mean, she just threw her arms around his feet and hung on for dear life. You got away once, you're not getting away again. Stop clinging to me, Mary. I haven't ascended to my father. I've got to be about the business I came to do. What a wonderful Savior. Imagine the day when we see Jesus. <laughs> it will be worth it all when we see him. Number three, verse 13. We talked about his centrality, his humanity. Look at his royalty. His royalty. Clothed with a garment down to the feet. That is a particular statement to indicate royalty. It isn't the a common tunic of the average person clothed with a garment down to the feet. If that were not enough, girded about the chest or breast with a golden girdle, the sign of royalty, the gold alone. But there's something more here. Not just that he's king, but I think, and I want to give you the reasons why, I think what we have pictured is our Lord is the high priest. Turn to Exodus chapter 28. Our Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest. Hebrews 3.1 says he's the high priest and apostle of our confession. There was only one high priest, you know. One at a time. Until the time of our Lord and through corruption, we had two actually, Annas and Caiaphas. There were reasons for that in history. But you just have one high priest, and that high priest goes into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. Jesus is our high priest. He's not a high priest after the order of Aaron. He's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. I talked to some people of a particular religious persuasion who believe that they have priests after the order of Melchizedek. And I said, well, that can't be because there's only one. And if you know who it is, then he's the Messiah. There's only one who's after the order of Melchizedek. There aren't two, not three, not an order, not a chain of them. Just one. That's all. And he's our Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus 28, verse 4. It says, And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, an embroidered coat, a miter, a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, having looked at that, turn to chapter 39, verse 29. 39, 29. 39, 29. Because remember, in the text, it says there's a girdle around his chest. Here, here's what it says. In verse 29 of 39, and a girdle of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet of needlework as the Lord commanded. Now on that is a plate also. Verse 30, they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like to the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. There's also on his chest uh, some jewelry which represents the ten, uh, 12 tribes of Israel. They're on his chest like it's on his heart. Like his responsibility is to intercede for the 12 tribes of Israel. And I got to thinking about all that. Turn to Psalm 93, verse 1. You got to kind of hang in there with me for a moment. Um, I guess a lot of these separated from each other. It's hard to put it together and say conclusively that the picture is of the clothing of the high priest. But perhaps you'll agree with me as you just walk through this. In Psalm 93, 1, it says, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with what? Majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. So the majesty of the Lord is being pictured by his clothing. I know these are metaphors, clothed with strength, clothed with majesty. But the picture in Revelation is of one clothed with a garment down to his feet, and with this golden girdle or strip around his chest. 
And that was similar in fashion and design to the high priest of the Old Testament. And then the Lord describes himself in those terms, majesty, strength, being clothed and girded. Uh, look at Psalm 104, verse 1. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the, the heavens like a curtain. So the, the power, the greatness of God, O Lord my God, thou art very great, is pictured by being clothed with honor and majesty. And I think that's a picture of what we have. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Let me tie this together in a sense of the priesthood of Christ. Hebrews chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, the book of Hebrews, dealing with the royalty of Christ, his clothing, perhaps illustrating the high priest himself. Chapter 3, verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Uh, go to verse 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has built the house hath more honor than the house. So the exalted position of our Lord as high priest. Look down at verse four, uh, 14, or chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now here's where you find an amazing combination in the Bible. Let us therefore come boldly under the what? Throne of grace. So wait a minute. Priests don't sit on a throne. Interesting that we're talking about Jesus being the high priest. And that we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted. Well, then let us come boldly under the throne of grace. Talk about royalty. Now we go from priest to king that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. By the way, there were no chairs in the temp temple or the tabernacle. Priests never sat down. Flip back to chapter 1. Chapter 1. Is everybody having fun? <laughs> Amen. I hope I don't lose you along the way here. Hebrews chapter 1, remember the priest never sat down. One of the reasons for that is to indicate the continuous ministry of priests. But now look at what we have in Hebrews 1, 3. Speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And, and here in Hebrews it discusses a high priest Who's sitting down? What is the picture of sitting down? The work is finished. There's no more sacrifices to be made. He gave us a once and for all sacrifice. Look at chapter 7, please, of Hebrews, verse 24. Chapter 7, 24, until 8, 1. Watch this carefully. Chapter 7, Hebrews, verse 24. But this man, because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests who have infirmity or weakness. But the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forever. Wow. Forevermore. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And I say hallelujah to that. Isn't that great? He's li ever living to make intercession for us, constantly praying for us, constantly defending our cause, and it's all done. The payment for our sin is done. 
So in the courtroom of heaven, you've got a prosecuting attorney, the enemy, the devil himself, who according to Revelation 12 won't be kicked out until the tribulation period. He, he now has access to the throne of God, and the devil is day and night, according to the Bible, accusing the brothers and sisters. What's going on right now is the devil is reminding God that the guy preaching and the people sitting in the pews are not what they say they are. Amen? Amen? Why do you agree? No, but anyway. <laughs> the devil knows we don't deserve or are worthy of the grace and forgiveness of our Lord. And he's accusing us day and night. The devil is the accuser of brethren. And the Bible says, my translation, don't sweat it. No problem. Why? Because we have an advocate a defense attorney, Jesus Christ the righteous, who ever lives to make intercession for us. Romans 8.34 says, who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died, it's Christ who's risen again, and it's Christ who's at the right hand of the throne of God making intercession for all of us. Those are legal terms. He's defending your case. Jesus Christ is our defense attorney. And what he's pleading our innocence over is that his blood has washed us white as snow. We are holy and blameless, not because we prove that we deserve to be pronounced such. We are holy and blameless because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us so through his precious blood. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are forgiven, we are clean, we are white as snow. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful gospel we have. Back to Revelation 1. I'm not moving very fast. <laughs> We're talking about his centrality, his humanity, his royalty. Number four, his purity. His purity. Verse 14. His purity. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. I would expect gray hairs in the audience to come through with an amen right now. Praise God. Amen. A little respect here from those who have not turned gray yet. And those who have white hair, just kind of expand a little bit. Praise God. We're talking the blessing of God. Amen. Now I said what I did facetiously to tell you that some people believe that what's pictured here is just the age issue. I don't believe that, but some do. Uh, they refer to Daniel 7, where we were looking at a moment ago, as the Ancient of Days, and there is a reference there to his hair and his head looking like this. So some people believe that the point of this is that he is the eternal uh, one and uh, ageless, and the white hair represents that he's been around a long time and he'll be here for a long time to come. I'm not satisfied with that because in the text he added the words, white as snow. Now I think we're talking holiness here and purity. Go back to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And look at verse 18. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Come now, the prophet says, let us reason together, saith the Lord, quoting the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as what? White as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We're talking purity and holiness. As a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus is referred to in the Bible as the Holy One. The Bible says he is without sin. Hebrews 4, 16, without sin, 4, 15. Called the Holy One. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. The purity of the Son of God, the holiness of the Son of God. The Bible says, be holy, for I am holy. And we fall so, so far short of that. Were it not for his sacrifice, how in the world could we ever be holy? How could any man be clean before God without the Lord? Luke 4, 34. 
This is an unclean demon. Let us alone. What have we to do? What, ha, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I need know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Here's a demon who knows who he is. You are him who is all pure, totally separate from sin. As Hebrews 7 says, we looked at it a moment ago. Look at Acts, please, chapter 2. When Peter was preaching his great sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, look at verse 27. He quotes from Psalm 16 to prove that the passage does not apply to King David, but to a future son of David. In Acts 2, 27, he said, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou allow thine Holy One to see corruption. And down in verse 29, he makes it very clear. It can't refer to David because his tomb is with us today. He's buried and his sepulcher is here. His body decayed. Yet it says in that passage, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. And Jesus' body never did see corruption. He rose the third day before any corruption could set in. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. Acts 3, 14. He's called the Holy One. Peter says, but you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, pointing out the enormity of their sin to exchange for the blessed Son of God who is all pure, totally separate from sin, you brought a murderer to be granted unto you. How could you have done this? The holiness and purity of our Lord. Go back, please, to Revelation chapter 1. It is important to understand that in this particular verse, it says his head and his hair were white. But notice, it, I don't know if you have italics in your Bible. The word his, hair, is in italics in mine, and were is in italics. Me, there's no verb. His head and hair, white. And then the simile is like wool. So if I'm uh, reading this in a literal, accurate way, the resurrected Christ, his head and his hair, are not brown or black or red, but white. It doesn't say like white. It says it is white, and it's white like wool of a sheep. That's what it says. And I think that's interesting because the purity of the Son of God, uh, the holiness of God, the Son, will be very observable to all of us when we see Jesus. The purity of our Lord, white as snow. Number five, the fifth thing I draw to your attention about our Lord, not only his centrality, his humanity, his royalty, his purity, but look at his scrutiny. And I think that's a good word for this. It says his eyes, verse 14, were like a flame of fire. What's the point of that? Turn back to Daniel chapter 10. His eyes are like a flame of fire. It doesn't say a flame of fire is his eye. It says it is like, there, there's a likeness in external appearance as his eyes are, are looking at you. It's like a flame of fire penetrating, scrutinizing uh, your life. He sees all. You can't escape it. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. The Bible speaks in Hebrews 4.13 that uh, we are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to deal. The eyes of the Lord are always everywhere, going to and fro. The Bible says they look down on the sons of men. They see everything that is taking place. The scrutiny of the Son of God. You can't escape. You can't hide. He knows what you're like. Daniel 10, verse 6. When Daniel saw this man clothed in linen, it says his body also was like the burl and his face like the appearance of lightning. And his eyes were lamps of fire. Uh, that's probably the passage it's quoting. Uh, look at Daniel 6, verse 16. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said unto him who stood before me, O my Lord. Here he calls him, O my Lord. I look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 18. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. The touch of the Lord. But the, the uh, original appearance of his face, like lightning, his eyes, 
like lamps of fire, Daniel 10, 6. Go back to Revelation and look at chapter 2. When he addressed the church at uh, Thyatira in, in Revelation 2, 18, he even mentions this characteristic in relationship to this church, which was a terrible church in terms of its um, morality and its condition before God. And in chapter 2, verse 18, he said, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire. Interesting that these characteristics are applied to different churches for different reasons. They have a point. The scrutiny of the Lord. He sees it all, and we're facing his judgment as a result. All things naked and open unto the eyes of, whom, of him with whom we have to deal. Look at verse 23. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searcheth the minds and the hearts. So the description back in verse 18, eyes like a flame of fire, we connect with the phrase in verse 23, he searches the minds and the hearts. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The fact is, none of us know our own hearts. So how foolish of us to think that we know somebody else's heart. The Bible says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who then will reveal the counsels and thoughts and intents of the heart. You don't know your heart, but God does. And in Jeremiah 17, 10, the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the reins of the heart. The psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. It's a searching of God. You can't escape him. And when you see the resurrected Christ, you're reminded that he knows all things. Did you think you could hide from him who is the Son of God, the one who died on the cross for your sins? He penetrates through all of our self-righteousness, all of our attempts to hide and be deceitful and to cover up. He knows it all. His eyes are like a flame of fire. You'll stand in his presence and know that you have been searched. And praise God. It is his own precious blood that allows us to stand before him on that day of our resurrection as glorified with him in glory. We appear with him and purified and holy and without blame in his sight, the Bible says, because we've been washed clean, not because of anything we've ever said or done. I was sharing Christ with a man just this week who said, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but I have not done bad things he said, I have been a good person most of my life, and I'm sure that God will let me into heaven. I said, there are a lot of good people in hell. He said, there are? I said, yep, there sure are. People with good intentions will be there also. I said, friend, I'm sure you're sincere about how good you are, but God knows the truth. God knows the truth. You don't need to tell folks how wonderful you are. You don't need to do it at all. First of all, it's not true. <laughs> you need to tell them how wonderful the Lord is, which is true. The eyes of the Lord search, and they know. It, interesting, look at chapter 19. The fact that God would bring this to our attention about the eyes of our Lord. Um, I point this out one time I was talking with a lady about... Um, her burden and problem at a funeral service and how she was hurting. And she spoke about, I, I really long for the day that I could look into those precious eyes of the Lord Jesus. And I didn't say to her then because it was meaningful to her. But I thought to myself, I wonder if I should read her what Revelation says. <laughs> I thought, better not, David. Let her just rejoice in the comfort of the Lord. But I thought, you know, looking into the eyes of the Lord as a resurrected Christ is not presented to us as a comfort. It's presented to us as a reminder that we've never gotten away with anything and that he knows us better than anyone else knows us and he searches all of the thoughts and intents of our hearts and no one can escape. He knows it all. And in Revelation 19, verse 12, when he's coming again in power and great glory, look at how it describes him. Verse 11, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were like a what? Flame of fire. There it is as you see the Lord come. A flame of fire is coming out of his eyes. We have a different picture of Christ here than we've had throughout the Gospels. 
Uh, we're running out of time. One more. Back to Revelation 1. At least I get into 15. <laughs> and his feet were like fine bronze as if they burned in a furnace. Fine bronze or brass as if they burned in a furnace. What are we talking about here? We've mentioned his centrality, his humanity, his royalty, his purity, his scrutiny. This is his victory. It is interesting to me what the feet of the Messiah picture, especially fine bronze burned in a furnace. Many writers will write and say it's a sign of judgment, but let's go and take a look at it. First of all, in Revelation 2.18, is it not interesting that that church at Thyatira that was so far away from God the characteristics of our Lord that are mentioned, eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine bronze. He's going to judge them. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Revelation, which pictures a great judgment coming from our Lord. Chapter 14, verse 19 and 20. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden. It means to be trodden by feet. Trodden outside the city. Blood came out of the winepress, even under the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred uh, furlongs. We're, we're talking a very serious matter here. About two hundred miles with blood up to the horse's bridles. It's almost like that great cleavage in the earth between the plains of Jordan and the plains of, of Israel, what we call the Jordanian Valley, has become one giant wine press, and the blood is flowing up to horses' uh, uh, bridles. And what, what is this wine press? It says it's a wine press, verse 19, of the wrath of God. He's treading it out. Uh, look at chapter 19, verse 15. When the Lord comes in power and great glory at the end of the tribulation, we have the battle of Armageddon, but verse 15 says, Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, the with it he should smite the nations, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth with your feet. You tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. We're talking about his ultimate victory over all the nations of the world. Now turn to Isaiah 63. This is the last passage tonight. Isaiah 63. And is this ever remarkable? When the Lord Jesus comes back at the time of the Battle of Armageddon, many people say his feet is going to stand on the Mount of Olives. That's where he's going to come, based on Zechariah 14. His feet will stand there, but not initially. When you go up on the Mount of Olives and stand on the top, it's a victory ascent of somebody who's already conquered. Where he's going to come, he's going to come to Basra. Man, I knew that would get your attention. <laughs> Several people say, what, what, what? Oh, he's lost his mind. Where is he? <laughs> he's going to come to Basra. The Bible says so. You say, why? Because that's where all the nations of the world will be gathered to go against Israel. The Battle of Armageddon. Well, is this the Basra we heard about in the Persian Gulf War? No. B-A-S-R-A? -S no. It's Basra, B-O-Z-R-A-H, which is in Jordan. And on the plains of Jordan, miles and miles of plains, if you've ever been there, I've been there several times, you realize that's about the only place you could assemble all these uh, multi-nations uh, uh, of the world with their armies coming against Israel. That's the way it would happen. And the Lord's going to come there. Now watch this carefully, Isaiah 63. I'm sure I've got your attention. Amen? It's a good time to finish and... I can get out of here and you can ask Chuck what this means. <laughs> no, seriously, listen carefully. Here's what it says. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Edom is Jordan, east side of the Jordan River. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Now, the voice speak. I who speak in righteousness mighty to save. The question, why art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him who treadeth in the wine fat? Answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was none with me. 
For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my remnant. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed has come. And I looked and there was none to help. And I, I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury it upheld me. I will tread down the peoples in mine anger, will make them drunk in my fury and I'll bring down their strength to the earth. How interesting the next verse is I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord. My friends, we are talking about the Messiah coming back to Basra, the winepress, the fierceness of the wrath of God, treading out, smiting the nations, uh, defeating all those who come against Israel. Then with blood stains all over his garments, he rides the white horse to the top of, of Mount Olives, gets off his feet, stand on Mount Olives, and he claims victory over Jerusalem, which is his city and belongs to him. It's a great picture. And my friends, when it says in Revelation 19 that his clothes, his vesture was dipped in blood, it is not referring to the cross. It's referring to his treading out the winepress of the wrath of God, the blood of all of the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. When Jesus was in the synagogue in Nazareth, he picked up Isaiah 61 and read a passage and said, Today is this fulfilled in your ears. What he read was that today is the day of salvation, now is the accepted time. What he did not read, and the day of vengeance is come. He, he didn't read that part. So in the synagogue reading of that day, Jesus referred to the fact that he had come to save. He was the savior to heal the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn, to turn the garment of heaviness into praise and blessing, that we would be plantings of the Lord, oaks of righteousness, that God would be glorified. But the next statement is, he is going to come with a day of vengeance. And that is what Revelation is all about. God is going to inflict on this world system and all nations who thought they were getting away with something. He is going to judge them and the blood is going to flow. And interesting in Revelation, the blood that the Savior tramples out as he destroys and slaughters the nations of the world that come against his people. It's interesting, the Bible expresses it as divine retribution for the blood of all the saints and prophets and martyrs through all the ages who cried out and said, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood? And the answer, it's coming, the end of the tribulation. The day of vengeance. His victory is described by his feet as he will tread the winepress of the wrath of God. We need to stop here and let's pray.